Hey, I'm James. Let's talk about making custom RP2040 based boards. Well, actually, let's talk about how to debug them during turn on. In this video, I demonstrate some tips for soldering QFN parts, show the components I use most often in RP2040 designs, and walk through the turn on phase for these four copies. Turns out, this is not the video I intended to make because I forgot to ask the simple question how hard could it be to make a custom RP2040 based board? Let's find out. These boards are for a tool I am calling a state mode logic analyzer. Here is its schematic. However, in this video, I am entirely focused on the RP2040 section. KiCad has a good RP2040 symbol built in that I usually use along with the built in QFN footprint. Now, my schematic is not all that special because most of it is found in the hardware design with RP2040 PDF from Raspberry Pi. It covers all of the major blocks in very good detail. And it even has a complete schematic that you can download to start in KiCad. That reference design uses a lot of 0402s and 0201s, which can be tough to hand solder, even for me. I prefer to use 0805s or more often 0603s. However, the QFN is still going to require a little bit of patience. I mostly use my non-special hot air tool and my super advanced reflow oven with custom controller. For soldering irons, I use two chisel tips that are small and more small. The super advanced reflow oven is great for packages with a pitch up to 1 or 1.27 millimeters like SOIC. But surface tension rarely aligns the 0.4 millimeter QFNs and there are usually solder balls shorting them out. Part of the problem is my terrible paste printing technique, but that's the subject for another video. Usually I have to remove the QFN from the board, then I clean up the pads with isopropyl alcohol. I apply a small amount of my favorite flux SMD291 and carefully place the chip. At this point I heat the board from behind with hot air. After the flux boils away, I watch for when the solder starts to melt. The magic moment is when surface tension snaps the chip into place. If you notice parts around it starting to wiggle, then you might want to give the chip a very light tap. If it resists your nudge and goes back to where it was, it's probably done. Otherwise, it'll snap into place where you can nudge it again. Soldering these parts doesn't usually require a microscope, but you will probably want one to inspect the pins of the QFN. So far, all of my designs for this microcontroller use a linear regulator to drop USB down to 3.3 volts. The RP2040's I.O. can operate up to 3.3 volts. However, its logic core runs at 1.1. Thankfully, it has a built-in linear regulator to support that rail. Since many of you know me from my endless talks on capacitors, this next part might surprise you. Comparing my circuit to the reference design, you might notice the lack of decoupling capacitors. I tend to only use 0603 one mic and 0805 10 mic for decoupling. After all, multi-layer ceramic capacitors are already smaller capacitors in parallel with each other. Also, with the package sizes I'm using, the power pins on the RP2040 end up sharing them anyway. And I like to put them on the back of the board. I am sure there are opinions on that choice. Follow the link below to let me know about them on the Element 14 community. In the meantime, I put a link in the show notes to an excellent article from Eric Bogatin and colleagues that covers this topic better than I just did. Oh, do not forget to add LEDs to the power rails. They are super helpful when turning on the board, at least if the voltage is high enough to bias them properly. I know many people think that MicroPython is the only way to code for the Pico or the RP2040, but I very rarely use it. Instead, I am a big fan of the C SDK from Raspberry Pi. I program it using VS Code, which has always worked great on Unix-based systems. It's a Unix system. Fortunately, a one-click installer came out for Windows, which worked well for me. There is also an Arduino core for the RP2040, so you can use the IDE or Platform I.O. When it comes to flashing the binary and debugging, I have a Seeger J-Link Mini that I use with these small headers. But you could also use another RP2040 board running PicoProbe like this Seed Studio Shao. Shabazz on the Element 14 community made that dev board and modified PicoProbe to work with the Shao. Also, Raspberry Pi now offers a dedicated probe. Both of those options are meant to plug into the Pico's 3-pin header, which you could replicate in your circuit if you do not like my adorable header. 
Regardless, do not rely on programming over USB. At the very least, break out the SWD pins to test pads. The one thing I hate about the Pi Pico board is that there is no reset button. So I highly recommend adding both a reset and boot select button. One reason is that it makes programming via USB super easy. That is much easier than fiddling with a USB cable while holding down a button. Related, let's talk about how the bootloader mode works. After reset, the RP2040 checks to see if the Quad Spy chip select pin is pulled down. If so, it goes into bootloader mode. That is why the schematic shows a 1K resistor connected to ground and chip select. Also, the RP2040 goes into this USB boot mode when the flash chip fails to respond. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. Now for the push buttons, I am a fan of these PTS-810 from CNK, even if they are a bit tough to hand solder. An easy to solder surface mount alternative are these PTS-525, which are a bit larger. And if you are space or cost constrained, at least add pads that you can short with a wire. By the way, you can download a copy of this schematic in the show notes. It has a link to all of the part numbers that I am using. Okay, let's go to Pass Bald Engineer and troubleshoot these four boards through turn on. The first thing I want to check for are shorts on the power supply rails. So let's look at 5 volts and now 3.3 volts. And for the 1.1 volt, I have to use the resistor that I had meant for the LED. And those all look really good, except when I go from 1.1 to 3, those two supplies are shorted together. And the reason is probably related to the way that the pins are laid out on the RP2040's package. The upper corner has many 3 and 1 volt pins that always gives me trouble. I resoldered the QFN. This time I just popped it off and then back on. Then I attached the USB port to a bench power supply and verified that it only drew a few milliamps. Next, I connected the J-Link debugger to the board. The debugger can see the RP2040. And when I load the blink code, the LED blinks. The reset is working. And then if I hold down reset and press boot, the LED stops blinking. However, in my computer, there's no RP2040 drive. But if I look in device manager, I have a USB port that is failing. Remember when I said not to rely on USB? Well, it looks like I had some soldering issues to fix. Now that I've got that much better cleaned up, let's plug this into USB. I don't see a complaint, so now I'm gonna hit my two buttons. Aha, the drive mounted. So now I'm going to try copying a UF2 file just to see if it'll program. Okay, so then I can just drag and drop that file. Say yes. Uh, it reboot and the LED is flashing. Yeah, I know these LEDs are really dim. It's because of the Mega 2 project, I had the resistors way too low, so they were way too bright. And I'm just trying to recover my retinas at this point. So we've got our first one working. Let's move on to the next. So this next board is working a little bit weird. Watch what happens. If I plug it into USB for power, and then I'm going to try and program it with the programmer. J-Link can connect to it. It is halted, but okay. And then if I try and program code, it says it downloads, but the LED doesn't blink. So this had me perplexed until with this one simple trick. Oh, come on. This time it doesn't work. Right before I hit record, I could swap the orientation of the USB connector and it would show up as a boot drive. Now it's not showing up at all. Or I'm starting to wonder if this RP2040 might have been cooked one too many times. So before spending any more time on this board, I want to try some of the others first. When I attach the USB, it shows up as a boot drive. And if I copy a UF2 file, it looks like it programs, but then it just comes back as a boot drive. I also find it interesting if I press the reset button, I can see the drive disappear from Windows and then it comes back. Remember the boot diagram from before? Let's use an oscilloscope to verify if the EEPROM is responding correctly. I am connecting a twin lead adapter to the EEPROM's chip select pin. I bet you guys didn't know I use a camera sometimes. So we'll run the scope, we reset the microcontroller, and a whole bunch of activity just happened. So if we go back in time with history mode, we can actually see the very first assertion of the chip select. And then about a millisecond later, a couple more assertions, and then nothing. So we can see the RP2040 is trying to read from the chip, 
but failing. For comparison, let me jump ahead and show you a chip that is working correctly. I'm gonna clear the screen, and then we're gonna do a reset. So we can see a couple of accesses just like before occurs, but then a whole boatload of activity after that. So this is what we should be seeing on the chip select. But let's go back to the non-working board to find its problem. Since both the debugger and PC can talk to the chip, I'm thinking there's a problem with the EEPROM. So let's take a look at its four data signals. Turns out I only need to look at two signals to find the issue. Reset, reset, reset. Each reset causes an update on the oscilloscope. Now I'm going to move over to SD2, plug this in. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so I thought SD1 looked funny, but SD2 isn't even showing up at all. Using a microscope, you can see that two pins are not connected to the pads. I added some flux, put a blob of solder on the iron's tip, and briefly heated the pads. And now on the microscope, you can see the pins look connected. Then I cleaned up the flux residue, especially since some of it did not get activated. Okay. Hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. Didn't come back. <laughs> yes. Blink, blink, blink. I don't know why, but blinking LEDs always bring me joy. The only thing is if I hold down reset, hit boot, and then release, we're not going into the bootloader mode. I'm just gonna try one more thing. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, a minute ago, this board wouldn't get out of the bootloader, and now I can't get it to go into the bootloader. So I'm going to tie the chip select directly to ground. So yeah, it goes back into the bootloader. So I think the push buttons themselves are damaged, probably because I used too much IPA when cleaning the boards, so I can swap those out later. Let's move on to the last board, which I got working using all of the troubleshooting I've already shown. Uh, so right now it's doing the blink, and then if I go into the serial monitor, and I run an I squared C scan, it finds these two devices, which if we look on the board, there are three ICs. However, only two of those ICs are I squared C. One's a potentiometer and the other is a digital analog converter. After all of that, I have two boards working great. And now that I finally have two working boards, we can talk about the state mode logic analyzer project and why did I only populate half the circuit on each? But maybe we can do that in a future video. For these boards, the biggest issue I had was definitely not getting a good print of the solder paste, because pretty much everything came down to fixing solder joints. So overall, how hard is it to design a custom RP2040 circuit and then troubleshoot it? Well, I think if you know where to look, it's pretty easy. But let me know what you think. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to finally get to my actual project.